Let's sit. Let's sit here. Good. Let's talk. Okay. Let's talk to the camera here. You ready? Hi, everybody. Uh, we're here today with Rocky again. Uh, he looks. He's a little more excited to be here today. Uh, but we're here to talk to you about songbirds. Uh, here we are. Uh, the last three groups of our class, ID-wise, will all be songbirds. There's going to be a lot of sounds, as you can imagine, given that they're songbirds. They sing sounds. They're all members of the order Passeriformes. Uh, we'll discuss that order. We've discussed that order. Uh, we'll discuss some other things about that order in lecture. Um, we covered uh, a first group of songbirds on the first week. They were winter birds that were, you know, birds that were here in the winter. Um, and uh, and we're going to add to that. So it's a really large group in the past era for me. This is the largest group of birds are in that order. Um, and yeah, there's just a bunch of them. And they make a ton of noise. And uh, all of the noises are pretty much tweet, tweet, tweet. Or z z z or zo 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 or... Uh, whatever, so we've got mnemonics that we put to a lot of these sounds to try to help. Um, hey buddy, yeah, he, that's what, Rocky likes that word apparently, mnemonics. Um, so we, we put that, we put mnemonics to, to sound to help us remember which bird says what, which sound goes to what bird. So they're going to be incredibly important now that we've gotten to this group where you'll have so many sounds to learn. The vast majority of, of your sounds are going to come from this. There's only one order, but there's a lot of families. Uh, we'll discuss those characteristics as we go of each family, um, and we'll uh, we'll get through it. We'll uh, we'll do this. There's three weeks left, or three groups left, I should say. Um, we we'll have a few more weeks than that because we're going to have some exams and we've got your presentations, of course, to give. Uh, but there's only three groups left. They're all songbirds. Um, this week will be a bit of a hodgepodge of, of a mix of of a couple different families. Next week will be all warblers. Yay, that's the fun group. That's the one that you've probably heard plenty of people complain about how difficult that is as a group. There's a lot of them. Uh, so we do them all at once together. Uh, and then the last group will be, another, we'll be back to another kind of hodgepodge of just a few different families mixed together. And, and most of these families we've already actually talked about, uh, but we're gonna add a lot of, a lot of new members to them uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. Uh, so, you know, as always, if you have questions about anything, send me an email. Uh, oh, goodness, buddy, you okay? Sorry, I think I just squished Rocky's leg in the desk. He's trying to stand up. Anyway, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Rocky's here to watch the video, unless, you know, I just scared him away. But opinion. Yeah, I did. He's had enough of me, so that's enough. I get it. I'll take the hint. Uh, so we'll, <laughs> we're almost done here anyway. So we'll, uh, we'll have our ID video here now. And let me know if you have any questions. Uh, here we go with songbirds. Okay, and like I just mentioned, uh, group one will start with a kind of a hodgepodge of families. We'll have a mix. We'll have several different families uh, here to go over in the order Passeriformes. Um, so without ado, let's let's get started. So it begins. Here we go. Uh, we've talked about this slide, the order pass era for me, we talked about it the first week of class. Um, so I'm not going to belabor that or go over it again. Uh, we'll, we'll have some more lectures on the order pass era for me, but, uh, I won't, won't be going over these details again. So, make, but make sure you do know, you know, their toe arrangement and the type of uh, babies they have and, um, things like that. Uh, so the first family is Tyrannidae. Uh, we covered uh, the uh, eastern uh, Phoebe. We covered in, in the winter. They're here all winter long. Um, but now there are some other uh, flycatchers that are arriving in the family Tyrannidae. Uh, our first would be the eastern wood peewee. Uh, first thing you might not know or you might notice about the eastern wood peewee is it looks a heck of a lot like an eastern Phoebe. So Eastern Wood Peewee, notice the hyphen there, make sure you, you have that when you write your common name, uh, is different from the Eastern Phoebe. So let's just, I know that's a close name, look very similar looking bird, but let's start to start to figure it out. So uh, for one, the Eastern Wood Phoebe or Peewee 
See, now I'm messing it up. The Eastern Wood Peewee has some faint wing bars, very faint. Uh, usually you don't mo notice much yellow on the breast and belly. That's usually pretty white. They have a bicolored bill. That should be helpful for distinguishing from the Phoebe is that the Peewees have bicolored bills. So yellow on the bottom, black on top. Uh, bicolor means two color bill. So the bottom uh, mandible is, is yellow. The upper one is, is black. Um, all the members of this family in order uh, will have anisodactyl feet. So you know what that means. Uh, all the members of this order uh, lay, have to are, uh, have altricial young. So they have to lay in, they make a nest. They have to sit on the eggs. And then they have to sit on the chicks for a while. Or, or you know take care of the chicks before they can fledge. Uh, so the eastern wood uh, peewee, uh, I did a side ID wise. It's pretty similar to the Phoebe, so that might confuse you. But sound, it's a little bit easier. Sound wise, uh, the eastern wood peewee is a name sayer, so it goes peewee, peewee. Uh, so hopefully you won't have any trouble distinguishing, uh, you know, Pee Wee and Pee Wee uh, from Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe. Um, you know, those are two two pretty different sounds, even though they've got similar mnemonics. Next up, we've got the great crested flycatcher. So flycatchers are the, the largest family of birds, um, but there are um, there aren't that many on our list, and we do have several. Um, and, and there are plenty here in the east. There's far more uh, in the western United States and in and, and other places in the world. Um, so there are a lot of flycatchers out there. If you think about the abundance of, of insects, of flying insects particularly, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it provides for a lot of different species of, of flycatchers, uh, these birds that, that feed on flying insects mainly. Uh, so the great crested flycatcher visually, uh, as far as flycatchers go, it's pretty colorful. It's got a yellow belly and uh, a little bit up into the breast. It's got a gray chin uh, or throat. Uh, it's got this kind of reddish brown in the wings. It's got one white wing bar um, or maybe two, one, one bright white wing bar and one a little bit uh, thinner and fainter white wing bar uh, and then brown down into those primary feathers. Uh, and uh, and the, that, that reddish you see on the wings there extend out into the tail. Uh, I believe we have a, a specimen of a great crested flycatcher, so you'll get to see that in person. Uh, the mnemonic for their sound is, uh, is kind of an easy one, but it's, uh, it's not a sound that stands out when you're in the forest. It can kind of blend in pretty well, so you're often you'll miss it. So again, this is why it's important to keep listening when you're out in the woods, birding. Uh, keep your ears open, stay quiet. Uh, birds that don't have a long song or don't repeat their song, you know, incessantly, uh, they might just blend into the background. This is one of them. The mnemonic is breep, breep, and it's usually pretty loud. And you heard a cardinal there in the background, so don't get confused about that. The, 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 Flycatcher is the one going breep, breep, breep. Uh, the next one is the Acadian flycatcher. And so we're going to have the Acadian flycatcher and the least flycatcher that both look very, very similar. Uh, they're both very small birds. They both have a white, small white eye ring. 
Oh, went backwards. A small white eye ring. They both have a bicolored bill, yellow and black. Uh, they both have two white wing bars. Now, the least flycatcher is smaller and is typically here in the Appalachians found in higher elevations. The Acadian flycatcher is a little bit bigger uh, and we'll find it uh, in not just high elevations, but all in, in uh, lower elevations as well. Um, but usually you'll find Acadian flycatchers right next to streams or, or at least near a stream or a river. Uh, they like to be somewhat close to water. Uh, so that's helpful. Um, you don't have to know a sound for the least flycatcher, but you do for the Acadian. You need to know them both visually. Uh, so take your time studying uh, those, uh, the pictures here, and look at the, the Sibley page uh, and do your best to figure out which one's which. Remember, the Acadian flycatcher is the larger one. The least flycatcher is, is a little bit smaller, but it's not a big difference. Uh, so that's, that's not going to be incredibly helpful. Uh, but do, do the best you can. And in fact, usually habitat is going to be the best clue here. Uh, and so the Acadian flycatcher, its mnemonic is pizza, pizza, pizza. It's another one that's not going to just keep saying pizza over and over again. It says it once and then it takes a big break before it says it again. So it's easy to overlook this sound, to miss this sound when you're out in the woods. Uh, if you're doing a, a point count, you got to really pay attention because you there might be an Acadian flycatcher right there. And typically these are uh, can be kind of important birds when you're talking about forest management because they usually are next to streams so they can be an indicator of stream health or at least the availability of streams. Uh, so it's important to, to just keep paying attention to listen to every sound you're hearing. And that's, that's a subtle sound of pizza, and that's it. That's all it does, and it's quiet for a while, and then it says it again. Uh, so just uh, it's, that's easily missed. Um, that's, that's kind of a theme here with the flycatchers, these small, delicate birds that, that make a kind of delicate sound. Uh, and then we'll move on to our, our largest flycatcher that we have on our, our, our list, the Eastern Kingbird, uh, Tyrannus Tyrannus. This is a, um, uh, it's a pretty cool bird. They're around, they're in, uh, usually found in grasslands or in early successional areas. There's an Eastern and a Western Kingbird. Uh, the way to tell them apart is this white line on the bottom of their uh, retrices. Uh, the kingbird, the eastern kingbird has that. The western kingbird does not. Uh, we don't have western kingbird on our list, so you don't have to worry about distinguishing them for class. Uh, the eastern kingbird is is all kind of this really dark gray or black down the back. Uh, again, they've got the white line at the end of the tail. They've got a little bit of a hook on their bill, if you'll notice there in the the photograph. Uh, they also have uh, a, a, a crown that they can flash or keep closed, kind of like the kinglets. The ruby crown kinglet has that little crown that it can that it can flash at you if you irritate it, uh, or it'll just, usually it'll just kind of keep that concealed. You won't even see it. Well, that's the same for the king, the eastern kingbird. They have this orange or reddish orange crown that they'll flash if they get irritated. So you won't always see that, uh, although. Uh, these these can these birds. If you do playback, they can get ir irritated pretty quickly and flash that flash that crown at you, telling you to get out of here. This is my territory. Uh, and so the new, the sound is is kind of a uh, it's a pretty unique one. Uh, we uh, the mnemonic kind of compares it to this electrical sputtering. It goes zip 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 If that helps for you, then great. If it doesn't. You know, come up with something else. This is a lot of birds that that we're covering for the next three weeks that just have these squeaky little peepy -pee sounds. That um, you know, there's just they're all. If you if you're not careful, they all sound exactly the same. So try to try to fit your mnemonics to these sounds. And when you hear the sound, hopefully the mnemonic's going to pop into your head. And again, this one we we usually say to the Z.
And there were distinguishing marks on the breast or belly, just all white. Uh, so that's also something to look for. And again, this is a, a grassland or early professional bird. Uh, so you'll often see them like on power lines uh, or, you know, maybe a small bush uh, because those are often the tallest things around. Uh, next up, we're going to move on to a new family, the family Hyrundinidae. These are the swallows. Uh, so we've already seen a couple of swallows show up here. And uh, when we were at Waynesville Rec Center, we saw a couple. Uh, let's see, Monday's lab saw a tree swallow. Uh, Wednesday's lab saw a tree swallow and a northern ruffling swallow. Uh, I've also seen barn swallows around at Lake Junaluska. So the swallows are here. They're usually one of the first things to return, or, or one of the, I'm sorry, middle things to return, not, not the immediate first things, but they're up here pretty early. Uh, so purple martin is uh, pretty much purple all over, as the name suggests. Uh, the wings are purple. The body's purple. Even the bill looks a little bit purple. No, it's black, but it looks a little purple. Uh, and the wings are a little bit darker than the rest of the body, uh, but it's just a, a purple swallow. There's no other description to it. So, so we actually call it a purple martin is the species. It's a martin, not a, not a, which is in the swallow family. Um, but we just don't call it that. So uh, purple martins are what you see nesting in gourds. Uh, so you see the uh, the picture here down here in the uh, in the middle, well, kind of second from the left on the bottom. You'll see those gourds. When you see those hanging up, people have hung those up usually for purple martins, and they do like to do that. They nest in colonies. They're colonial nesters. Uh, so they and they're also cavity nesters. So they like to have a bunch of little cavities like this around uh, that they will that the purple martins will nest in. Uh, so when you see those, usually you'll see them out uh, near a farm field or something like that, or out in somebody's big, you know, if they've got a yard with a lot of grass, that's where you'll find purple martins and they'll, people put up boxes for them. They, do, they eat a lot of mosquitoes, uh, so it's good to have them around. Uh, you'll, you'll often see European starlings taking over uh, purple martin gourds. They, they do that from time to time. Our next swallow is the tree swallow. So this is the one we both labs have seen now outside. We, we saw them at, uh, at Waynesville Rec Center. Uh, so the tree swallow is all white underneath. And I mean, bright white. There's no like hint of gray or a little bit of gray or anything like that. And, I, and we're just talking about the, uh, the adult, the breeding adult. They're, they're just really bright white underneath, no, no gray at all. Uh, and then the, the back is this iridescent, uh, bluish green it depends on how the light's catching it uh, but it, yeah, so it can look blue it can look green because they are iridescent uh, no forked tail on neither neither the uh, purple martin nor the tree swallow have a forked tail that's something you want to look for when you're looking at swallows look for it to see if they have a forked tail that's going to help you with with uh, narrowing down your, your species uh, so again the tree swallow all white underneath bright white bluish or green iridescence on the back. No fork in the tail. The barn swallow is our species here with a fork that has a fork tail. Uh, it's all brown or reddish brown on the front uh, and the belly and the all the way up through the, the chin and even just above the, the uh, bill there. It's all brownish, reddish brown. Uh, and then the back is usually blue. You, you don't get much green. This is a uh, barn swallow is a little less iridescent than the tree swallow is. So it's usually blue is the color you're going to see for the barn swallow. And the important thing to look for is uh, is that forked tail. That really makes it obvious that you're looking at a barn swallow. Uh, barn swallows nest in barns, as their name suggests. So if you look at the picture in the bottom left, you'll see a barn swallow nest. If you go uh, to a lot of the national parks, if you go into the buildings, uh, like if like uh, if you go in um, Catalucci Valley, you go into the building there. We, we've been in with uh, in dendrology lab. We saw some of these nests uh, in there, and they, they'll do that. They'll go into just about anywhere they can get into and, and build their nest, and they they do like buildings quite a bit, so they'll they'll do that. Uh, and they build their nest with the, with mud and saliva that they kind of make into these little balls that they then just attach to the wall. Uh, kind of similar to chim to the way chimney that chimney swifts make their nest, but a little more mud involved here. Remember, swifts are in a completely different order. 
Uh, next up, we have the Northern Rough Wing Swallow. So the Northern Rough Wing Swallow is another one that's white on the belly. But if you look at the breast, it's gray. The head is gray. The back is gray. Overall, it's very gray. It does not have a forked tail. So barn swallow is our only one we're learning that has a forked tail. So that, that's a good, easy way to narrow that down. Um, and then the, the rough wing swallow is, is gray, but, uh, uh, you know, with the just a, up in the breast and, and on the head and back, the belly is white. Tree swallow, all white, breast and belly, bluish, greenish on the back. Purple martin, all purple. Uh, northern rough swing swallows usually nest in the sides of, of river banks, stream banks, or cliffs even, um, where they live, live in, uh, in cavities like, most, like, like a lot of other swallows. Uh, our last swallow we're going to cover is the cliff swallow. It looks kind of similar to the barn swallow, right? It's a little bit bluish with some of that brown, reddish brown involved. Uh, but look at the belly. The belly is all white uh, or like grayish white. It's not bright white like the tree swallow, but it's, it's pretty white. Um, and it's certainly not brown or reddish brown like the barn swallow. So right there, you should distinguish this is not a barn swallow. This is a cliff swallow. Some other things to look for, they've got this white forehead on the cliff swallow. Uh, and when they're all they're colonial nesters, uh, and as their name suggests, they nest on cliffs. They build these little uh, nests that you can see here in the in kind of the middle couple of pictures, uh, where they they nest in a big colony. You see them all sitting on their nest, and you see those white triangles sticking out. You can just see those all across the cliff whenever you come up to a cliff swallow colony. You'll see all those little white foreheads and it makes it obvious, you know, yep, besides the fact they're just nesting on a cliff like this, but this is definitely a cliff swallow I'm looking at because you see that white, that triangle on their forehead. Another thing you could look for if they're flying away from you, maybe, or you just, you don't get a good look at the head, uh, is the, they have a rump patch, this kind of rusty reddish rump patch. Uh, that's also very obvious when they're flying around. So, so that head's obvious. The rump patch is obvious. They don't have a forked tail, so that also differentiates it from a barn swallow. Uh, they're pretty whitish underneath, uh, but not, not as bright white as a, a tree swallow. And they've got a, a brown chin, so that's, that's different from a tree swallow as well. Uh, so hopefully, this, you know, the swallows, they can trip students up sometimes, but hopefully it's not going to be too tough of a group. I think if you just learn those few key distinguishing uh, characteristics, you'll, you'll have an easy time of figuring out which one's which. Uh, we're moving back into the family Corvidae. So we already talked about the American crow and the common raven. We've got one more to discuss, one more corvid here in the eastern U.S. Oh, of course, we talked about blue jay as well. Um, so one more to cover here, well, in North Carolina, at least, we have the fish crow. There's a couple more corvids down in Florida uh, and farther south from us. But here in, here in North Carolina, we only have those few corvids. Uh, and the fish crow is the last one we cover here in class. Uh, the fish crow just looks like a small American crow. So raven looks like a big American crow. Fish crow looks like a small American crow. The good news is this is the only crow you have in this semester, so, or this half of the semester. Uh, so we covered Raven and American Crow in the first half of the semester. That was on your first exam. Fish Crow will be on your second exam, but you probably won't have American Crow or Common. You won't have American Crow or Common Raven on your second exam. So if you see a crow on your second exam, you should assume it's a fish crow. Uh, their sound is is pretty crow-like. Sounds very similar to a crow to American Crow, um, but it's more nasally, and they just go wah wah. Wah, and they kind of repeat that over and over again. So it's not like an American crow, which has a thousand different songs that make this whole racket. They make a bunch of different noises. Fish crow, usually when you when you observe them, they're just kind of making this one noise. And, and they do also have like a, a high-pitched gear. And then wah, 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 wah. And as you can imagine, as the name suggests, they're usually near water or around water. Um, 
you follow their range map there, you know, they're cold, they're around the coast and then they go up the Mississippi river Valley. Um, so they like, you know, large water, I guess. Um, but the fish crow learn it. It's just a small American crow. And here's a, here's a good sign. I mean, there's a different species, but it's just, they, they look like a small American crow. There's a good uh, comparison slide here. So you've got the two American crows are the big ones. The fish crows, the small one. So they're pretty small. Um, and I've actually, I've heard them here uh, uh, farther west than what the range maps have them at. Uh, I've, I've heard them, I've seen them around. So uh, keep your ears open for, for fish crows. You'll, you'll hear them as you get closer to the coast. Uh, you'll hear fish crows. Uh, and now we go back to the family Paraday uh, and we add a chickadee to that family. So we already talked about tufted titmouse and Carolina chickadee. Uh, and now we're going to add black capped chickadee. <clears throat> uh, and notice here it says oral only. That means you only need to know the sound for this one. So uh, like the, the uh, whippoorwill and, um, and Chuckwill's widow, uh, I'm not going to make you distinguish between black capped and Carolina chickadee. They are uh, very similarly looking, um, and I guess I could have just had you know that this was a black cap chickadee because for the second half of the semester, uh, but I feel like that's a bit lazy. So you don't need to know uh, sight wise the black cap chickadee for this class. Uh, you should learn it. We do have them here in the mountains in higher elevation, so uh, we're talking pretty. We're talking well. I think over four thousand elevation is when you'll start getting black cap chickadees. So they're way up there. Uh, and they're they're much more rare than the Carolina chickadees are here. As you go farther north, they become much more common, and Carolina chickadees don't really exist. Once you get uh, far enough north, they're just not around. Uh, pretty much where you see the black cap chickadee range end is usually where the Carolina begins. Uh, and so, and they also have a similar sound, but whereas the Carolina chickadee says Carolina or I will kill you, the black capped chickadee just goes kill you, kill you, and it's usually way out of tune. Uh, like they, somebody needs to teach them what pitch they need to be singing in. So visually, it's identical to Carolina chickadee almost. Uh, the white stripe is a little bit bigger. The, uh, the, the brownish color on the sides is usually a little bit darker, a little bit uh, takes up a little bit more of that flank. Um, but the differences are pretty subtle. The nape's a little bit of a different color. Um, it's more of a greenish color here on the black capped chickadee, but it's still pretty gray. So. Um, so again, I'm not gonna not gonna make you distinguish between the two on an exam, um, but I do want you to know this, be able to distinguish the sound on an exam. So uh, if I play you the black cap chickadee sound, you should know that's a black cap chickadee, not a Carolina chickadee. They also do the chickadee 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 dee dee sound like the the Carolina chickadee does. That's that's a very common sound among chickadees. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, we'll go back to the family sit today now, and we're going to add one more nut hatch. This is our third nut hatch we have here in the eastern United States. Uh, in fact, we've only got four nut hatch species in the United States, period. There's a pygmy nut hatch out west that we don't have here in the east. Um, but so you're, you're learning all three that we have here. The brown headed nut hatch is our last one, and it's the smallest one of the three that we have. Um, they have a brown cap on their head, like the name suggests. They're kind of bluish gray body, uh, upper body at least. And then underneath their belly and breast is all pretty, pretty white. Uh, maybe with a little bit of gray, uh, but it's, it's pretty white. Um, they, uh, you'll see that we don't typically find them here in the mountains, although you might. Um, they're around sometimes. I, I've found them in certain places. You gotta be really looking. Um, and uh, and what you'll usually hear their sound it, when you when they're around. They're very they're very vocal. They sing a lot. And the um, 
we like to compare them to a dog with a squeaky toy. That's what they really sound a lot like that. Uh, so just imagine, you know, a lazy Sunday afternoon, uh, you're hanging out with your dog, you know, Rocky sitting down from a chair. He's, he's hanging out right here and he's got his, his squeaky toy with him and it's just a lazy day and he's just chewing on it, enjoying himself, relaxing. And then at some point I see Rocky over there playing with his toy and he, I go over there to pet him and play with him with the toy. And he gets really excited and he just really starts going to town on that thing. And it sounds like this. So there's the two different sounds to pay attention for, to listen for when you're looking for brown-headed nuthatches. Again, one's a, a dog with a squeaky toy. kind of sounds like they're relaxed. Just a couple of squeaks, just, just playing around with it. And then, you know, when the dog gets excited, start really chewing on that toy, going really fast, making it squeak a lot. Uh, and now we're back to the family Troglodytidae. These are the wrens. So we had winter wren and Carolina wren in the first half of the semester. Well, now the house wrens are going to start showing up. Uh, and they're a very common bird across the United States. Um, and in fact, if you uh, start paying attention right now, as there's the uh, always, you know, the springtime is the time for, for lawn care commercials, for commercials about your grass, getting the scots out there on your grass getting fertilizer, getting uh, um, uh, insecticide, spraying your grass and seeding your grass and feeding your grass and watering your grass. This, this giant monoculture waste of resources and environmental disaster that is your lawn. Well, every single one of those commercials that are coming right now, Lowe's, Home Depot, Ace Hardware, whatever, They've pretty much all got a house rent in them. That's the sound of uh, the sound of spring is when the, the lawn care commercials start coming on and you start hearing house rents. Uh, they're going to be outside. You'll hear them outside, too, of course, around your house and your neighborhoods. They're around, uh, but you'll definitely hear them uh, in in these commercials, too. So start paying attention if you're watching TV at night or, or you know, in the afternoon, whenever you're watching TV and you hear a. Uh, you're watching the commercials. You see a lawn care commercial come on. Pay attention. Listen for this sound. And I also used to uh, compare this sound to it's, it's becoming more and more irrelevant as people, you know, don't even know what a, some people don't know what a VCR is. So, you know, we have younger students in this class, too, that maybe have never seen a VCR or watched a movie on a VCR. Uh, but it used to be when you had a VCR and you if you let it play and then you hit the fast forward or the re rewind button, it would let the sound still play, but it would play it really fast. So it would sound really high pitched and it would go really quickly through it. And you could see the people moving real fast and you'd hear the sound just super sped up would be this high pitch. Uh, so you know, to me, I've always, I don't, for whatever reason, when the first time I heard a house ran when I was a student, uh, the sound struck me as man, that kind of sounds like a VCR. If you, if you let it play, you know, you let the sound play and you fast forward it. Um, so, you know, that's a, just a blast from my past. If you if you don't know what I'm talking about, then come up with something else. Uh, but uh, that always works for me. And I, I think it's a pretty good, if you know what I'm talking about, then, then hopefully it, it registers with you as well. Particularly at the start of the song there sounds like that to me. So, you know, whatever works for you again, pay attention to the lawn care commercials that are going to start coming on right now. People talking about their yards, you will hear this bird. Maybe that's the way to know that's the commercial bird. I hear it in the, in the lawn care commercials. 
Uh, here I've just provided you a comparison slide. Carolina Wren on the top left, Renter Wren on the top right, House Wren on the bottom. You know, they've all got the classic Wren pose where they, they stick their tails up. Uh, they've all got this, this, these striping in the wings. Although if you look at the house wren, it's a little bit different from the Carolina wren. And that's a little bit different from the winter wren. Uh, but they've all kind of got these black and these black and brown stripes in their wings. They've all got a slightly decurved bill. Look at how big the Carolina wren's bill is. And the house wren's bill is, is pretty long as well, but not quite as thick. Uh, and the winter wren is pretty small build. Of course, we have Carolina wren and winter wren specimens, so you've seen those two beside each other. The winter wren's much smaller, the Carolina wren's much larger. The house wren's kind of in the middle. It's, uh, uh, it's the medium size of the three. Uh, and it's a lighter color than both of the other two. So the, the winter wren is usually very dark brown. Carolina wren is pretty dark brown on the back, lighter brown on the, on the breast and belly. And of course, that Carolina wren has that bold white uh, supercilium that stripe right above the eye. Uh, and the winter wren has a, a little bit of a stripe above the eye. The house wren has even less. It, 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 you'll see them with a little bit, but it's not very noticeable at all usually. Uh, so you might not even see it. So, so little to no uh, supercilium on the house wren. And that's the only wren we have in this half of the semester. So it'll be the only one on your exam. Uh, next up, we've got a new family, Polyoptilidae. These are the gnat catchers. Uh, and as their name suggests, they eat a lot of flying insects, just like fly catchers eat a lot of flying insects. Well, so do gnats, gnat catchers. Uh, not necessarily gnats and flies, by the way, but, but flying insects. And, and the gnat catcher is a pretty small bird, so it's usually pretty small insects. Think mosquitoes, think gnats. Uh, that's what these birds are eating. Uh, when we go to Sapelo Island, if we get to go uh, anytime while you're a student here, uh, blue gray gnat catchers are usually are usually around and they're usually very responsive to playback. Uh, so we usually do get to see blue gray gnat catchers and, and, and often actually when we get to do our mist netting, sometimes we catch them there on Sapelo Island. Um, so so you, something to look forward to. Uh, we you'll often hear the blue gray gnat catcher referred to as the mini mockingbird. Uh, for one, because it kind of makes an intermixed sound that's, that's kind of complex, uh, that doesn't really have a good mnemonic to it, uh, but also because it's got the white outer retrices and it's kind of a grayish bird. It's more bluish, but it's kind of grayish. It's got a longer tail compared to its body. This is a small bird, so it's not a really long tail, but it's, it's you know, in proportion to its body, it's pretty long. It's kind of the shape of a mockingbird uh, and it's grayish and it's got the white outer retrace. So that's why we call it the mini mockingbird. Uh, but then you start looking a little closer, you know, it's much bluer. It does not have white wing bars like a mockingbird. It's got a white eye ring and it's got an eyebrow. It's this black eyebrow that goes above its, its eye there, uh, the supercilium there that, that looks, looks like an eyebrow and often makes this bird look like an angry bird. Uh, so you'll sometimes see that eyebrow making it uh, just it, it looks like an angry eyebrow. It's, it's pretty frequent when you see this bird in the wild. That's what it looks like. Uh, so, again, the, the sound is kind of complex. It's an intermixed sound with with complex parts. Uh, and then you'll hear them go speed, 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 speed. And then they'll do their intermixed complex thing. That's the speed, speed. And the good news is they do the speed speed part, you know, a lot. So it's not, you're not waiting for that to happen or, you know, is that some sort of weird bird making some crazy complex noise? No, they're going to say speed speed quite a bit. So, so learn that part of the sound and that's the one you should put to, put to memory. Uh, moving on, we're back in the family tur today. Uh, the thrushes, we have a few thrushes to add. 
uh, and these are going to be brown spotted thrushes like the hermit thrush. Uh, so we already learned the hermit thrush. We we put that in our brain. Now we're going to add the veery and the wood thrush that that all look very similar. Uh, the veery. Um, is typically found in higher elevations. Look at their range map, you'll see how they're, you know, you kind of see that uh, breeding range come all the way down the Appalachian Mountains. When you see that, a range map that looks like that, that usually means it's a higher elevation bird. Uh, so the Veery is one we find in higher elevations. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of a neat bird. They nest in the understory like a lot of the thrushes do. They just nest on the ground or in a bush, in a shrub. Uh, the Veery's got a uh, light colored spots or they're they're there but they're not super bold like the uh the wood thrush is which we'll look at in a second and the hermit thrush is a little bit more bold than that as well uh, and you'll notice the spots don't go all the way down through the belly they kind of stop just at the breast area um there's no eye ring on the very really to notice uh and the noise is is really the 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 defining characteristic. It sounds like a video game. It sounds like game over actually in a video game, uh, maybe an old arcade game. So, the, you know, again, the word we kind of use to describe that that sound that the wood thrush and the veery and the hermit thrush make is ethereal, this ethereal sound. It's kind of metallic, uh, very metallic for the vireo. And again, to me, the, the I'm sorry, veery, not vireo. Uh, to me, the veery sounds like it's 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 a game over, like you're, you're playing a video game and you just lost and now it's game over. Pew, 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 pew. If that works for you, then then use it. Uh, as far as distinguishing between veery and hermit thrush, remember that the hermit thrush, uh, as it gets towards the tail, it gets more of this reddish brown. The, the brown kind of changes color. So the tail is obviously different from the rest of the body. On the veery, it kind of stays reddish brown over the whole course of the body. So all the way down the back and all the way down the tail, it's all one color. You don't really notice a difference in color between the tail and the back. Uh, and then the third, the, the third brown thrush that we'll learn is the wood thrush. Um, this is the typical thrush that uh, we hear about, or very common, at least in our eastern woodlands uh, in, in all elevations. Uh, and the wood thrush is, is similar to these other two thrushes, that it's all brown down the back and very spotted down the front. The wood thrush has the most spots, and they're big, dark brown or black spots. The wood thrush has a bit of an eye ring, uh, and the sound is fairly unique. It's it's kind of similar to the hermit thrush, except they don't say C at the start. Remember this: the hermit thrush went C E L A. Um, well, the wood thrush just goes E L A, E L A, E L A. Uh, and here we have the comparison slide. So you've got hermit thrush in the top left. You know, notice it's it's a different color brown going down the back than the tail is. Just a good picture there. You can see how it gets reddish brown on the tail. The rest of the back is more of a, a grayer brown. Uh, and then the veery, which has very faint spots on the, the breast uh, that don't extend too far into the belly. Uh, and it's much more of a reddish brown going down the back. The wood thrush in the bottom here in the middle which is pretty reddish brown going down the back, but it has a clear defined eye ring and very dark, uh, larger splotches going down the breast and belly. 
Next up, we'll return to the family Mimiday, and we're going to add a couple of mimics. So we had the uh, the um, the northern mockingbird that we covered in the first half of the semester, uh, and if you'll recall, the mockingbird repeats its its sounds three times. Uh, the we maybe we should start with the brown thrasher, which only repeats its sounds twice. Uh, and there's in fact uh, some mnemonics that you could put to this, like pick it up, pick it up, put it up, put it up. Where, where, here, here. Oh, put it down, put it down. Um, that's one of the mnemonics for brown thrasher. So again, it just repeats everything twice. And these, all three of these in this group, the mockingbird, the thrasher, and the catbird are mimics. So they, they can mimic other sounds. They can change their sounds. They have different sounds. Uh, but the brown thrasher and even the catbird to some extent is usually a more consistent than the mockingbird is. So usually uh, most brown thrashers have this same song that they, that they do. They have the, the repeating uh, that you could actually put some, some mnemonics to phrases. Um, and they're, they're usually pretty similar. They might jumble up the order of those uh, or mix them up, but they're usually singing the same song. Uh, they can learn a few different songs, but they're not like a mockingbird who's just everyone is singing a completely different sound. Uh, so keep that in mind. The brown thrashers are usually a little more consistent across individuals. ID wise, you might think, oh God, it looks a lot like the wood thrush we just talked about. It's got those really dark brown spots going down a white belly. Uh, but look at the tail on the brown thrasher. That's very long. That's a thing with mimics. They all have long tails. Look at the cat first got a long tail too. Think back to the mockingbird had that really long gray tail. The brown thrasher has that a long brown tail. Uh, two white wing bars on the brown thrasher. Look at the bill. It's a really long bill that's kind of decurved. Uh, and then they have a yellow eye. So that should help you distinguish brown thrasher from, from our couple of thrushes that we learned. Um, and then we're going to actually, when we get to warblers, there's a, there's a couple of warblers that are brown and spotted too. Uh, but look, the brown thrasher is fairly large uh, for a songbird, and it's got it's got these, you know, it's certainly larger than the thrushes, uh, the two those, those brown thrushes at least, and the uh, and the any warblers that we cover. And then you know, look for those two wing bars. Look for the yellow in the eye. Look at how the spots are different on the brown thrasher than they were on the on the wood thrush, you know, more round on the wood thrush, kind of more lines or streaks on the brown thrasher. And then the gray cat bird, uh, all gray down the back, except for the top of their head, their cap, which is black and uh, mostly gray going down their breast and belly and all the way up to their under tail coverts, which are actually brown. So they've got this rufous brown under tail coverts, uh, gray the rest of the body, black cap, black eye, black bill. That's it. Everything else is gray. Uh, so that's the gray cat bird. And um, where the brown thrasher repeated twice, the mockingbird usually repeats phrases three times. And remember, not always, but you know, not every phrase, but it will repeat some three times. The brown thrasher usually won't repeat any phrase more than twice. The gray catbird usually doesn't repeat any phrase at all. It usually just kind of sings a jumble of, of varying phrases uh, intermixed with this meow sound where it gets its name from its catbird sound. So I'm going to play the meow first. And I've heard some that sound a lot more like a cat than others. So keep that in mind that that meow can, can vary a little bit. It can be much more cat-like even than, than that sound was. Um, I've had, uh, there's been times where I've been, swear to God, that's a cat in that bush when no, it's a, it's a cat bird. Um, so here's the varying phrases where they don't repeat anything, 
they just keep going with a jumble of uh, a mix of different phrases uh and then they'll make it'll mix in the cat sound the meow sound in between So it's always important to keep listening when you're out in nature. If you, you know, you got this bird, man, it's making a bunch of wild noises. I can't really pin down a mnemonic. I can't decide what it's making. If you keep keep listening, at some point a cat bird's gonna hopefully meow, do a meow at some point, either mixed into the phrases or give you just a couple meows at the end of a phrase. Um, just you know, keep listening. Uh, we're adding one more, another family here, Motacillidae. These are the pipits. Uh, this is a bird that's only here in North Carolina during uh, migration in, in parts of you know, the tip of the mountains. Uh, and for the rest of the state, it's here in the winter. So this might have been better covered in the winter birds. Uh, but it's not very common here in North Carolina at all. We don't typically find American pipits here. You got to look real hard. Um, but you'll see it's much more of a prairie bird. And in fact, it's much more of a tundra bird. Uh, so they're heading up to the tundra now. They might be migrating through here, uh, but they're they're kind of brownish, you, you know, a little bit sparrow-like as far as their colors. This kind of grayish brown, a lot of modeling, uh, a lot of spots on the breast and going down to the belly. But look at that bill. That's nothing like a sparrow bill. It's very long and pointed versus a sparrow with a conical bill. And it's look at the legs. It's got kind of long legs. They're black. Uh, and you see it standing up. Look in this bottom picture, kind of towards the middle. You'll see one standing up in a grassland. They're a grassland bird. Uh, so they need to be a little bit taller to be able to see up over some of the short grasses. Uh, so look at how long that, that leg is. I've also had students at times confuse this bird with a shorebird uh, because, you know, it, it does kind of have that, you know, those legs kind of do say shorebird to me, too. I, I, I kind of get that. But this is not a shorebird or or a sparrow. This is a pipit. Um, and what I look for for pipits is the C in the face, uh, the letter C, right around the eye. Uh, so if you notice uh, the auriculars, that's the feathers right under the cheek there. The bottom, they have like a, a line of white under them. And then they also have a, a supercilium that's white. And that can be a little bit more connected than this one or less connected depending on the individual. But I always look for that shape, that kind of C shape to say, oh, that's an American pipit. They've got that C on their face. And you don't have to know a sound for the pipit. So we're ready for that. There aren't many songbirds we're getting, we're, we're getting out of the sounds on. Here's another one you get to get out of not having learning a sound. The loggerhead shrike, uh, which is one of the coolest birds out there. I, I am a big fan of the shrike. I just think this is the the coolest songbird that that exists it's just so neat um this is a predatory carnivorous songbird uh so there's a whole group there's a whole family of shrikes uh lenny a day so there's more than one species of shrike but here in the eastern united states at least in the southeast uh we have the loggerhead shrike if you go farther north there's a northern shrike uh but our shrike here in north carolina is the loggerhead shrike they all look pretty similar uh, here in North America, they're this bluish gray, very similar looking to a mockingbird. In fact, uh, if you look at the picture in the kind of uh, to the left, second to the left on the bottom here, you'll see a white wing bar, very similar to a mockingbird, white outer retrices, very similar to a mockingbird, grayish overall, black face mask, kind of, I mean, the mockingbirds is not as black or uh, thick as this, as the shrikes is, but they've got one. So it looks, it looks a lot like a mockingbird. And, and often, uh, you know, if we're ever driving around 
uh, a place and you you see me watching power lines and stopping to look at every mockingbird that we pass, it's because I'm probably looking for a strike. They they look a, a lot like mockingbirds, especially when they're out sitting on a power line or uh, on a fence row. Uh, they look very similar to a mockingbird. So you got to look close. And what you look for is that that black mass gets thicker on the strike than it is on the mockingbird. And look at the bill on the loggerhead strike. Again, this is a carnivorous predatory song, songbird. So they have a hooked bill, a hawk-like bill. Uh, they don't have talons. They don't have hawk-like feet. They just have a hooked bill uh, to to kill their prey with or to, to eat their prey with. Um, and in fact, again, since they don't have talons, they're not really able to uh, to to kill their prey like a hawk or an eagle would. They don't do a great job of gripping their prey with their feet. Uh, so they use that mouth. They have to carry that mouth. And since they're using the mouth to grab their prey, they can't they don't do a good job killing their prey with their mouth, and sometimes they do. Uh, and uh, and what they what they will do though is take their prey and impale them on any sharp object they can find around. So you'll often find strikes in places where there are honey locusts, because honey locusts put out big thorns, and barbed wire. Uh, when there's places with a lot of barbed wire, uh, that's where you'll find a strike. And and these are grassland birds, native grassland. So you need a large native grassland with honey locusts or barbed wire. Uh, you know, these are all those things except for the barbed wire are things that are in shorter and shorter supply in this world. So guess what about the loggerhead strike? It's not doing too well population-wise. They are declining. There are species in decline. As a grassland bird, they're definitely in decline because their habitat's lost. Um, and, 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 you know, whatever, among other factors. <clears throat> but they do have this cool hunting technique where they will grab their prey uh they'll try to break their neck with their their bill uh but they're you know more concerned they're carrying their prey with their bill to a place where they might impale it with a uh again with barbed wire or a spike on a on a uh, locust tree and then they'll leave that prey hanging often they'll hang it and they'll leave it there for a few days and come back and eat it later or munch on it periodically um and it's it those those you know you'll if you go to an area where there are flogger head strikes you will find trees uh, or barbed wire that have you know little rodents or little songbirds or even snakes hang or lizards hanging off of the barbed wire or the thorns on the the branches when you see that you know there's a strike around uh, that's like a pantry to them that's that's where they just kind of store their food they'll leave several different uh, critters hanging up on their on their little larder there they're they're just their store of food and they'll come back and eat it later uh, so when you're when there's a strike in an area you'll know it uh, because you'll find that that food uh, you know a pantry kind of laying around these all these different little creatures just impaled on things um, so so a neat bird a songbird that is carnivorous uh, not insectivorous but carnivorous actually eats meat um, they do eat insects as well, of course, and you know we could debate: is an insectivore also a carnivore? Maybe they eat animals, right? Um, but either way, this this bird is a carnivore. They eat meat. They eat. They're a songbird that eats little rodents and other songbirds and and reptiles and amphibians. So cool bird, really cool bird. I think it's my favorite songbird for sure. One of them at least. I always go back to fourth. What's my favorite bird? I never. I can't ever really make a decision. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, that is where we'll end today. Next week we will dive into warblers. It is the entire week will be devoted to warblers. So uh, you can imagine there's a lot of species of them, uh, and like half of them are yellow. So uh, just prepare yourselves. This was uh, you know this was our first or well really our second uh, dip into the songbird. The passeriformes order. Um, so you got a bit of a taste this week. I don't think the birds, any of the birds this week were that difficult. We've got some groups that might give you a little trouble. Uh, but you know, study these birds, get them behind you, because next week things are gonna go up and eat another level again. Uh, so just you know, as the, as they say, there's levels to this, and we are we're upping the levels as we go. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, please let me know. 
Hope you're all doing well. I'll get a lecture video posted for this week as well. Uh, you'll actually have two of those. Uh, and uh, I hope you have a great spring break uh, after you finish watching this video. So see y'all after spring break.